This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Hi guys, welcome to Amateur Chemistry. So, in today's video, I am going to start the incredibly complex synthesis of a very interesting cubic molecule called cubane, and let me tell you that I severely underestimated how hard that would be. In this project, I put all of my chemistry skills to use, as well as learn an incredible amount of techniques, reactions and laboratory methods. Also, this video is going to be part 1 of 3 for this synthesis, because there is just so much to talk about that I couldn't fit everything in a single video. Ok, so as you may know, there already is some Cubane content here on YouTube, and the person who introduced everyone to it is Tom from Explosions and Fire. He made it after 3 years of doing some sketchy chemistry in his shed, which is honestly really impressive, and his series was the main inspiration to start this one, so after you watch this video, I highly recommend watching his series on Cubane. Another person who made the cube is Sam from Chemiolis, and he did that in a very clean and academic laboratory style with amazing yields and beautifully white products, while Tom's synthesis is almost the exact opposite of that. I think that both of them have their own charms, and in my synthesis I will be somewhat in the middle of those two worlds, because after a year on YouTube, I managed to accumulate a nice amount of labor and reagents, but I still don't have everything, and I will need to use some rather sketchy methods later on. Also, I am doing this as a little bit of a personal challenge, because I haven't done much organic chemistry in my life, and I want to prove to myself that I can do it and defeat the almighty tar. Ok, so now let's take a look at the synthesis, because it's kinda nuts. As you can see, it has a ton of steps and involves various reactions like a bromination, photocyclization or a Diels older reaction, and overall is just incredibly complicated. However, if we see past these weird molecules and take a look at the reagents, we can see that they are actually pretty simple. I can buy most of them and make the difficult to get ones myself, which expands the scope of the synthesis even further, but at least on paper it seems doable. Also, you're probably wondering, why would I even want cubane in the first place? I mean, why go through this hell to make a white powder that pretty much doesn't do anything? Well, for a chemist, just the thought of making something with such a remarkable molecular structure is incredibly nice, and I think that here it is more about the journey than the final result. Cubane, despite having this unusual structure with 90 degree carbon bond angles, doesn't find much use currently, it's still technically a new molecule, and a lot of research is done on it, and it shows some potential to be used in medications, explosives, or some niche chemical reactions. If you want to see what cubane can be used for, you can head to the Total Synthesis channel, which has a few good videos about it. Also, I highly recommend that you watch other channels cubane synthesis videos, because some really good progress is being made, and it's great to see so many people try to make their own cubes. Ok, so now I can begin the synthesis, and the first step is the catalytic decarboxylation of adipic acid to cyclopentanone. This step for many people is optional, because in some countries you can just buy the cyclopentanone from a supplier, but I unfortunately can't do that, so I will have to make it myself, which should be pretty easy, but I won't claim anything here, because from the bit of organic chemistry that I have done, I know that sometimes the simplest steps can turn out to be the hardest. Also, before I start with the reaction, I need to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website creation platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. It allows you to easily create a beautiful website and use it for selling various things or engaging with your audience. Squarespace offers incredible features like their amazing Fluid Engine, which provides you with the best-in-class website templates and allows you to really unleash your creativity when it comes to website creation, which I myself tested and really enjoyed. Squarespace also has an amazing function of allowing you to connect various third-party extensions to your site, as well as use their powerful blogging tools that allow you to easily share everything from stories to videos or updates to your website, which in my opinion is just awesome. For a free trial, head to squarespace.com, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase. 
Okay, so to make the cyclopentanone, I need a chemical called adipic acid, which is just a longer version of oxalic acid, and it is actually used as a food preservative, so I was able to get half a kilo of it from a chemical supplier for pretty cheap. It of course looks like this white powder, and to turn it into cyclopentanone I have to decarboxylate it, and I have to use a catalyst for that, because it is one of these stubborn molecules that are too lazy to decarboxylate by themselves, and in this case I have to use some barium hydroxide or barium carbonate, and I went with the hydroxide because it was the easiest for me to get. Ok, so in this chunky beaker I weighed out 250 grams of adipic acid and then added 9 grams of barium hydroxide octahydrate to it. I mixed the ingredients thoroughly and got them into a 1 liter boiling flask, and before starting the reaction I wanted to put some boiling chips in it to help with the boiling later on, and I was somehow out of broken glass, so I sacrificed this test tube for the greater good and added its remains to the flask. I then assembled a simple distillation apparatus and didn't grease it because I will need to heat things up to pretty high temperatures, and with everything ready, I cranked up my heating mantle to 300 degrees Celsius and put some aluminum foil around the flask to insulate it. As the flask heated up, the adipic acid began to melt and slowly decarboxylate under the presence of barium hydroxide, producing cyclopentanone, water and carbon dioxide which escaped the apparatus, while the cyclopentanone and water distilled over to the receiving flask. Also, as the boiling flask got very hot, the adipic acid started to sublime onto its walls, making this nice frost effect. Some of it also ended up in the condenser, contaminating my cyclopentanone, and I will need to remove it later. As the distillation went on, the boiling mixture started turning into yellow tar, which will be a recurring theme throughout this whole project, and in organic synthesis, you just can't really do much about it. Anyway, in the receiving flask, the water formed a separate layer below the cyclopentanone, and after 9 hours, when no more distillate was coming over, I stopped the distillation and collected my product. It looks like I managed to get most of the adipic acid to react, but some of it still stayed in the boiling flask as these nice needle-like crystals, along with some disgusting barium tar, which was a nightmare to clean. Also, it turns out that by not using any grease, the corner piece got stuck to the flask, but fortunately, I was able to get it off using a blowtorch. Anyway, the cyclopentanone that I obtained through the distillation is really dirty, it is contaminated with a ton of water and adipic acid, along with some yellow junk, which I have to remove. As the first cleaning step, I got a lot of anhydrous potassium carbonate into the flask, which will hold on to a great part of the water, as well as react with the residual adipic acid to form potassium adipate, which I then can easily remove. After the potassium carbonate addition, some carbon dioxide was produced, which indicated that the adipic acid was being destroyed, and to make sure that all of it reacts, I got the flask onto my hot plate and left everything to stir for a day. When I came back, the mixture had turned into this thick slurry, which I now have to vacuum filter. After a whole year of using this broken vacuum filter, I finally brought myself a proper glass fritted one, which does an amazing job at filtering this thick slurry. On the downside, it is extremely hard to clean, but the extra filtration speed really makes up for it. Anyway, the filtration went pretty smoothly, it smelled like this weird chemical mint, which is what cyclopentanone is supposed to smell like, and in the end, I was left with this cake of potassium adipate and a lot of alarmingly yellow cyclopentanone sitting on top of some water. To remove the water, I put everything into a separatory funnel and drained all of it away, I then got the cyclopentanone into a beaker and added some anhydrous sodium sulfate into it to dry it completely. Now that it is adipic acid and water free, I have to distill it to remove the yellow impurity, and I wanted to do this using my fractionating column, which is way too long to fit in my fume hood, so I had to assemble the apparatus on my garage table, and I managed to do it using a brick that I plan to give to a friend for Christmas. I started the distillation, but due to the column being so long, after 10 hours almost nothing came over, and the cyclopentanone got even more yellow, so I stopped everything, removed the column, and repositioned the lab support brick, which made the distillation go incredibly fast. I mean, it was just light speed, and in only 2 hours I was left with some nice and pure cyclopentanone, along with some disgusting tar. I weighed the product, and it turns out 
that I managed to make 104.8 grams of it, which corresponds to a yield of 73%, which is really nice honestly. I got some of it into a vial so that the final amount equals 100 grams, and I need this sample to later confirm its purity using NMR. I will also do that to most of the other molecules that I made in the synthesis, because they are all going to be either white powders or colorless liquids, and to prove that I successfully made anything, I need to analyze them. Anyway, for the second step of the synthesis, I have to install a ketal group onto the cyclopentanone to protect it during the upcoming bromination, because if I didn't do that, the bromine would easily attack it in the wrong place and screw everything up. To add it, I have to react my cyclopentanone with ethylene glycol under the presence of an acid, which sounds rather easy, but the trick here is that other reagents are quite non-polar, and using something like hydrochloric acid won't work, so I have to use a less polar one, and the most common acid used for this type of reaction is paratoluene sulfonic acid. I know that its name sounds scary, but it's just a combination of toluene and sulfuric acid, and similar to the cyclopentanone, it can be brought from some chemical suppliers, but it just so happens that almost none of them are in my country, so I have to make it myself. It's supposed to be quite easy and all that I have to do is to heat up some toluene and sulfuric acid while removing the created water to push the equilibrium to the product side, but that involves the use of a Dean Stark trap, which I unfortunately don't have. The trap is also necessary for the next reaction in the overall synthesis, but I will worry about that later, and now I didn't really want to bother with it, so I decided to go full Australian guy in a shed mode and just don't use it. I have heard somewhere that the paratoluene sulfonic acid, or PTSA for short, can be made without it, so I decided that it wouldn't hurt to try this method, even if this would mean losing a day or two. Ok, so to begin, I got myself some toluene, I measured about 50 ml of it and added it to a flask along with 50 ml of 96% concentrated sulfuric acid drain cleaner. And even though the toluene was supposed to be pure, the sulfuric acid turned yellow, indicating the presence of impurities, but I didn't care and assembled a reflux apparatus that will condense any toluene vapors, covered the flask in aluminum foil and started the heating and steering. Almost immediately, everything turned pitch black, which is a whole different level of tar than before. The reaction that is supposed to be going on here is the sulfonation of toluene on the para position. The created water should hold on to the excess sulfuric acid and push the equilibrium to the right side. Also, since there is so much hot sulfuric acid present, it drives tons of side reactions producing this black crap. Anyway, I left the steering overnight and when I came back it didn't look any better. The tar managed to form a thick suspension which looks really scary to work with, but that's what I should expect by going this route. To start purifying the product, I filled the beaker with some distilled water and then combined most of the tar with it. I also added some more water to dilute everything and stirred the mixture to break any large tar chunks. Now, if there is any product in there, it should be very soluble in water, unlike most of the impurities. So I did a vacuum filtration of the mixture to separate the solid tar from everything, which even with my new filter was really slow and I just imagine what I will have to do to clean it. But anyway, after the filtration I was left with this nice forbidden tea. It was still a little too dark for my standards, so I tried adding a scoop of activated carbon and filtering it through some cotton, but that didn't help much. To see if the reaction had worked, I now had to evaporate this down to hopefully crystallize out the monohydrate of my product while leaving all the residual acid and impurities behind. To do that, I got the filtrate onto a hot plate with steering and started to gently heat it. When most of the water was gone, I put everything into a fridge for an hour and when I came back, to my surprise, there were some dirty crystals in there. That meant that all of the target adventures didn't just waste my time, because the PTSA is pretty much the only thing that can crystallize out like that here. To purify it, I performed another vacuum filtration and I was left with some really nice looking crystals. They are still pretty wet, so to dry them I made this DIY desiccator consisting of a plastic food container, anhydrous sodium sulfate and sodium hydroxide. I put the wet crystals into it for a few days and when I came back they were much drier. I weighed out 0.7 grams of them to use in the next reaction and put the rest into this vial to test for purity later and in the end it's really nice that I managed to make some rather pure PTSA monohydrate without the use of any fancy equipment. 
Anyway, now with the catalyst ready, I can prepare for the next reaction in the cubane synthesis. As I said earlier, it is the addition of a ketal group onto my cyclopentanone, and when it comes to the reagents, along with my freshly made PTSA and cyclopentanone, I need some ethylene glycol and a solvent which can be either toluene, benzene or xylene, and I went with toluene that I got from an online chemistry supply store, BM Chemistry. BM Chemistry sells a lot of hard to get reagents, along with laboratory equipment and lots of other things, so you can check out their page, to which there is a link in the description. Ok, so to begin, I got myself a large 1 liter boiling flask and added a stir bar along with 0.7 grams of para toluene sulfonic acid monohydrate, 100 grams of cyclopentanone, 95 milliliters of ethylene glycol and 200 milliliters of toluene. The ethylene glycol is in a little excess here because it is said to give a high yield this way, also since the PTSA is just a catalyst, smaller amounts can be used, but 0.7 grams seems to give a good rate of reaction. As I said earlier, this reaction needs the produced water removed to work correctly, and there sadly is no easy workaround for this. This means that I have to use a Dean Stark trap, but since I had a hard time buying one, I decided to make it myself using some real sketchy components, and here you can see it in its full glory on my garage desk, because similarly to the fractionating column, it wouldn't fit in my fume hood. It consists of some glass joints and this very neat toluene filled glass vial to collect the water, held in place by an ungodly amount of teflon tape and a toilet paper roll. I actually came up with this design about half a year ago when I started preparing for this project, and now it is finally time to test it out. So to start, I turned on the water flow to the condenser and started heating and stirring the reaction mix. In terms of the reaction going on here, ethylene glycol reacts with cyclopentanone in the presence of the PTSA to form cyclopentanone ethylene ketal and water. It also just so happens that this reaction is in equilibrium and by itself it can only go to about 50% completion, so to push it forward I have to remove the created water to prevent it from destroying the product. I can do that by exploiting the fact that toluene can form an azeotrope with the water, meaning that it boils along with it at a lower temperature than it normally does and can carry it over the apparatus. And when the vapor is condensed, the water separates from the toluene and since it is denser it falls into the collection vial and the toluene comes back into the reaction mix to pick up more of the water, repeating the cycle. This is a very efficient and pretty much the only method of pushing this reaction forward, and after a few hours, I noticed a few small droplets of water coming into the vial. That told me that my DIY apparatus works, which is really nice, and allows me to save some money on the expensive Dean Stark trap. Also, if you would want to make something like this yourself, you can watch a great video by Nerd Rage where he made a pretty good Dean Stark trap from scratch. Anyway, I left this setup running overnight, and when I came back, there was a really nice amount of water in the vial. I also installed this piece of wire in it to move the water that sometimes got stuck and after a few more hours it seemed like it stopped coming over which indicated the end of the reaction, so I stopped hitting the flask and disassembled the apparatus. The reaction flask now looks like it is full of apple juice, it also has a layer of presumably some unreacted ethylene glycol on the bottom, and now it was time to extract the product from this mess using vacuum fractional distillation, but there was a tiny little problem, the stopper just wouldn't come loose. I made the mistake of stoppering the flask while it was still warm, and that made the cooling vapors make a vacuum in the flask which made the stopper impossible to manually remove. I tried almost everything, including tapping it with things or hitting the flask, but the method which worked turned out to be hitting the joint with a blowtorch. I wanted to avoid it because it has the potential of destroying the flask, but I had no other option left, and after hitting the joint for some time, the stopper suddenly shot out and made a crack in the joint, rendering it useless. Fortunately, nothing happened to the reaction mix, so I transferred it into a smaller flask and set this thing up for fractional vacuum distillation. This type of distillation is probably one of the most complicated ones you can carry out, because you have to keep everything under a vacuum and use a fractionating column to separate the various components. I need to use it here because the vacuum lowers the boiling point of liquids and normally my product boils at a temperature high enough to make it decompose 
and diffractionating column is necessary to separate the many components of the vapor by allowing them to constantly condense and evaporate. Also, my old vacuum pump and GUI just wouldn't be enough for the distillation, so I got a new and beautiful tube of professional grease, which was hella expensive and came from a very particular chemical company, but it should work much better than the engine one I was using. I also got this amazing vacuum pump for Christmas, and it's also much better than my old one. To start, I assembled my apparatus on the table again because of the column. I also connected the vacuum line to it and got the pump outside to prevent it from overheating. And when everything was ready, I turned on the vacuum along with the heating and waited for the first bits of liquid to come over. I was worried that my column will screw everything up as always, but fortunately, since everything now has a low boiling point thanks to the good vacuum pump, after just 2 hours something started coming over at 30 degrees celsius and that was just some toluene. It was a little cloudy, probably because of some water produced in the boiling flask, because all the reagents necessary to make the kettle were still present and I should have washed some of them off before the distillation, but I decided to let the reaction run for some more time. Also, I used my beautiful lab support brick for the distillation, but in the middle of it it was time to give it to a friend, so I temporarily replaced it with a carton of soup, which wasn't ideal, but it turned out that my friend also gave me a brick, so I swapped the soup with it and everything went back to normal. After all the toluene came over, the temperature increased to about 60 degrees celsius and I changed the receiving flask to collect my product, which came over surprisingly quickly, and after 5 hours the distillation finished leaving behind just some nasty tar. I disassembled the apparatus and got the flask with the distillate. It is probably pretty pure, but I am not 100% sure of that, because I didn't do the washing step before, so it still might contain some water and ethylene glycol, and to get rid of them I washed the distillate with a saturated sodium chloride solution and removed the residual water using anhydrous sodium sulfate. I then quickly vacuum distilled it, which left me with some really pure ketal and a tiny amount of tar. After all this time and effort, gigabytes of footage and thousands of words of the script, I finally completed the first major part of the cubane synthesis, which made me feel really proud of myself. When it comes to the yield, I managed to get 106 grams of the cyclopentanone ethylene ketal, which corresponds to a yield of 80%, which is honestly really good, and I didn't expect to get near as much. As always, I got some of it into a vial for analysis, so that the final amount equals 100 grams, and now that I have it, it is time to brominate it, which will be a hell of a ride, but I will do that in the next video in this series, since this one is already taking way too long. Also, as a very primitive way of checking that I actually made the ketal, I measured its density and it came out to be almost exactly 1 gram per milliliter, which is precisely what it should be, so that gives me a lot of confidence that I actually succeeded in the synthesis. Anyway, I hope that you guys liked the first part of this chunky project, and thank you very much for watching, like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, also, as always, big thanks go to my Patreons, and now there is so much of you that reading all of your names out loud takes a long time, so I would like to thank you all at once. If someone would also want to support my work and gain access to exclusive content, you can consider becoming a Patreon, and see you guys in the next video.